Democratic success story or hotbed of militancy five years after the Jasmine Revolution began is Tunisia's Arab Spring turning into an Arab nightmare. Also on today's program, striking a deal. After months of waiting, Libya's warring factions form a unity government, but will it bring stability to the country? And in picture this, the end of an era as Britain closes its last deep pit coal mine. Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. Five years ago, a young Tunisian vegetable seller, exasperated and desperate, set himself on fire. It was to be a moment that would not only shape the future of his own country, but also much of the Arab world. As Mohamed Bouazizi lay in a hospital near Tunis, the streets around him erupted into protests. Just weeks later, President Zain al Abidin Ben Ali would resign after 23 years in power. It would come to be known as the Jasmine Revolution. Five years later, some described Tunisia as the success story of the Arab Spring. At the end of last year, the country held democratic elections. But with a lagging economy and a growing risk of militant attacks, is Tunisia really proof of the Arab Spring's Arab dream? As we look at the current state of Tunisia, today's newsmaker is Mohamed Bouazizi, the street vendor who started a revolution. It was a revolution inspired by an act of desperation and defiance. Five years ago, anger and protest brought down the regime in Tunisia and led to uprisings across North Africa and the Middle East. It started after this man, Mohamed Bouazizi, killed himself. The vegetable seller's equipment had been confiscated by police. In frustration, he doused himself in petrol and set himself alight. The striking of a match would change Tunisia and the region. Peaceful protests turned violent. Police cracked down on Tunisians who were calling for political freedom and jobs, which only caused more anger towards President Zine al Abidin Ben Ali. We're sick and tired of him, of his tricks. We want him to leave. Get him out of here. We want the prisoners of conscience who are being held in this building right here behind you. We want them freed. They're being tortured underground here. And why? Because they dare to speak their minds. After 23 years in power, the president resigned. Many things have not come about as I would have wished, to be honest, in particular regarding democracy and rights. The demands for political change spread to Egypt, to Libya and to Syria and other countries. Some had revolutions. Others descended into civil war. Tunisia, though, has largely been stable, although recent terror attacks have threatened the peace. Three major terror attacks in less than a year. 73 people lost their lives. Tourists and the government targeted in attempts to destabilize the country. After years of difficult transition, Tunisia now faces a growing terror threat. In March, gunmen attacked the Bardo Museum in Tunis. 23 people were murdered. It could have been many more. Daesh, also known as ISIS, claimed responsibility. In June, the beach resort of Sousse was attacked. 38 people, mainly tourists, shot dead by this man, who was trained in Libya and said to be inspired by Daesh. And last month, a suicide bomb attack targeted the presidential guard. This is the aftermath in the heart of Tunisia's capital. Twelve people died here. For Tunisia, it represents a huge security challenge. More than 3,000 Tunisians are estimated to have joined Daesh, and extremists continue to pose a threat. As the country mourns its dead, 
Tighter security measures have been brought in. But Tunisia's leaders fear more attacks could take place. Since the fall of Bin Ali, a unity government's been formed and a new constitution has enshrined women's rights and freedom of religion. But the terror attacks have harmed an already fragile economy and tourists are staying away. The celebration of Tunisia's transition to democracy is still felt though and this month four Tunisian organisations won the Nobel Peace Prize honoured for helping to secure the peace. Even if it's a peace that looks increasingly fragile. Duncan Crawford, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Tunis is political analyst and blogger Yusuf Sharif. And in New York, we have Nicholas No, co-founder of Mideast Wire and director of the Tunis Exchange. Thanks for joining us, gentlemen. Yusuf, let's start with you. The Arab Spring was born in Tunisia. Is it dying in Tunisia now? It's not yet dying, but uh, it is facing a lot of issues, a lot of difficulties. However, um, clearly five years later, Tunisia is almost a free country, almost a democratic country. Uh, there were, uh, you rightly said that there were three major terrorist attacks, but also there were three free and fair elections between 2011 and 2014. Um, now Tunisians express themselves freely like never before, and they, ha they hold their uh, leaders accountable. Uh, but it's true, there are a lot of issues, a lot of difficulties, and uh, we're not yet in, on, on, the, on the safe shore. Nicholas, no, those of us who are taking stock five years on and focusing on a lot of the very bad things that have happened, are we not giving credit where credit is due? A lot of credit has been, uh, has been put on Tunisia and some of the Tunisian actors there that have made incredible sacrifices and incredible compromises to there to be lauded. Um, but just literally in the last hour, I got off a number of phone calls with friends and associates in Tunisia. Um, you know, in the last two days, dozens of people, friends, foreign business investors, activists, politi uh, you know, journalists, have been arrested by the security services. Um, there is an incredible reaction and a wave of security sector movements that have been happening in Tunisia uh, over the last few weeks and indeed over the last few months. The problem is, is that a lot of those are not actually tackling the issue of terrorism. They're actually making things far worse in the country by targeting journalists, by targeting other civil society actors and foreign investors as well. Unfortunately, the core problem that Tunisia faces right now is not actually ISIS or religiously inspired extremists, although they're a problem. The core problem in Tunisia is an incredibly corrupt and incredibly inefficient security sector that's aligned with some business elites and some traditional mafias in the country. And unfortunately, what I see and what I'm hearing just this morning is that it's only getting worse. The security sector in Tunisia is only getting more powerful, more corrupt, and more inefficient. And unfortunately, if and when there's another attack in Tunisia, as many of us expect, I think that this security sector is going to be unable to protect the country. And the reaction after the next attack is going to be even worse. And what they're going to do is they're going to radicalize more and more people. They're going to create Mohamed Bouazizis, but this time Mohamed Bouazizis that don't want just dignity and freedom and democracy, but that want to create a whole new version of society. Yeah, okay, let me pose some of that to Yusuf Sharif. Uh, Yusuf, cracking down on dissent and rounding up people under the guise of fighting terror sounds a lot like Ben Ali's Tunisia, doesn't it? I, I didn't hear the last part of, the, of your question, sorry. Cracking down on dissent and rounding up people mm -hmm. under the guise of fighting terror sounds a lot like Ben Ali's Tunisia, doesn't it? Correct, correct. I mean, um, as Nicholas was saying, this is the same police apparatus that existed uh, in Tunisia for the last uh, decades. And uh, the, the people, those who are cracking on activists, cracking on journalists, uh, on, on, uh, on all different kind of people, are the same ones who used to work under Ben Ali. They did not change from a day to the other. But this is something we've seen with many transitions, in, especially in Eastern Europe, where we have a corrupt uh, and a very 
um, aggressive and brutal police force that is there. And um, the problem is that you cannot delete it from a day to the other. And this is something that in 2011 we tried in Tunisia. The, the, there were attempts to, to, take, uh, to take off everyone from the Ministry of Interior and, uh, and bring new people, but it was not possible. Uh, the system was too strong. And um, yes, they are the ones who are now cracking down on, on, on activists, etc. But the difference between now and the era of Ben Ali is that now, whenever there is a harsh crackdown, uh, there are uh, campaigns against it. There are demonstrations in the street. There are people who are talking and openly speaking against this. And this is, um, for instance, yesterday there was uh, a young lady who was arrested and, and uh, brutalized by the police. And there was such a big campaign on social media, on, on the media, and, and uh, that the Minister of Interior himself had to intervene, uh, and you know because it was a scandal, had to intervene, and the girl and the lady is now is now free. And several things like this happened before. But and uh, another difference between now and the era of Ben Ali. And the Ben Ali, it was systematic. Uh, you say something against Ben Ali uh, on media, in, in public spheres, uh, in public places, etc. You get arrested. You get. Um, you get uh, beaten, you, go, you, you, you get um, thrown in jail, your family is annoyed. Today it's not anymore the case. It's, um, and, and the main reason being not that the police is now less corrupt or less br brutal than under Ben Ali, but because the police is less powerful. Nicholas, the Nobel Committee themselves, after awarding the National Dialogue Quartet the Nobel Peace Prize, said, and I quote, more than anything, the prize is intended as an encouragement to the Tunisian people. Has that worked, the encouragement from the Nobel Committee? Well, I think Tunisian citizens and people are encouraged by the Nobel Award. And I think the Tunisians are valiantly trying to fight for their hard-won democratic rights to be dignified citizens in a normal state. Unfortunately, I'll differ with Youssef in, in being far more bleak that that laudatory period seems to be quickly closing. For every single, you know, for every activist or journalist that is brutalized now and that is suddenly released because of the intervention of the Interior Ministry and social media blow up, there are probably dozens, if not more, on a daily and weekly basis of people, especially in the interior regions, especially folks that aren't well connected to social media, that are being brutalized, that are being thrown into jail, and that are being muzzled. And this is having the effect of creating a supportive environment for extremism, which is lurking all around the country and all around the region, in fact, for extremism to flourish. I differ with Yusuf also because I don't think Tunisia has another 10 years or 5 years to try and get its corrupt parallel state and the corrupt security services both able to do the job, to be efficient, and to be far less corrupt than they are, which is creating more extremists and a, a hotbed of insurgency against them and against this Tunisian state. I think we're running out of time, unfortunately, and I think that it's up to the big powers that support Tunisia, that support the citizens of Tunisia, they got to get behind those citizens and those Democrats, and they got to do a root and branch mm -hmm. reform of this security sector. And they got to do it now. It cannot wait any longer. In 2012 and 13 and 14, compromises were made by many of the political parties. They said we can push off security sector reform, we can reform the cops later, it's a tough job, we'll deal with it later. Well, unfortunately, time is running out. The region is on fire. Libya, despite the peace process today that might look successful, there are unfortunately states that are collapsing throughout the Middle East and North Africa. And unless there is an immediate and rapid root and branch reform of the security services, we are not going to be able, to, we're not going to see a Tunisia that can mm. protect itself adequately okay. from this storm. And we're certainly going to see more and more innocent people, foreign investors, journalists, and I dare say perhaps in the future elected politicians that are going to come under the boot of the security services. Okay. Not because of terrorism or counterterrorism, but because of bad reasons and corruption. Okay, let's get a final response from Yusuf. Yusuf, is there a major disconnect between good intentions and maybe even the law itself and implementation? I mean, just looking at a, a small recent example of six students who were given rectal exams and a three-year sentence by a judge in 
Kerwan for homosexuality, and that was passed down by a judge. It violates the 2014 Constitution itself. Nevertheless, this was implemented. Is there a major disconnect between all these good intentions and the law itself and what's actually going on on the ground? There is a major disconnect. Um, not on this particular one, because uh, the, there is also a major uh, schizophrenia in, in how the Tunisian law works. Uh, so you rightly pointed to that article that allows people to uh, behave and act the way they want. But also there is other articles in the Tunisian law that prohibit homosexuality. Even though then, on the other hand, the Tunisian uh, cliche or picture uh, boasts a country that is very open and very westernized and so on. However, there is a big disconnect. Uh, because mainly because the the power that um, that the state used to have before 2011, the power that the ministers, the police, the all the um, all the change and decision makers used to have before before 2011, does not exist anymore today. Okay, thank you very much, Yusuf and Nicholas. I'll let that be the final word because we have run out of time. Thank you very much for your knowledge, your expertise, and your passion, Yusuf Sharif and Nicholas. No. Still to come on the newsmakers, a deal is reached, but can a unity government rebuild Libya? And in picture this, we delve into the past as Britain's last coal mine closes. New hope for another country that saw protests turn to revolution and descend into chaos. Libya's warring governments have, after months of delays, signed a UN-brokered agreement to form a national government. The international community are hoping the deal would bring stability to the country and help fight a growing threat from Daesh. The newsmaker Charlotte Dubensky looks back at how the two factions reached this point. A country torn apart by civil war. For decades, oil-rich Libya was ruled under the watchful eye of Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. But Gaddafi's removal from power in the Arab Spring opened up a vacuum. In February 2011, revolts in neighboring Egypt and Tunisia inspired violent protests across Libya. In July, the International Contact Group on Libya formally recognized the main opposition group, the National Transitional Council, as the country's new government. In October, rebel fighters captured and killed Colonel Gaddafi. By January 2012, violence had broken out between NTC supporters and rebel forces. In August, the NTC bowed down and handed power over to the General National Congress. Then in October, the Congress appointed Ali Zidane as Prime Minister of Libya. In February 2014, protests erupted when the GNC refused to disband after its mandate expired. In March, the GNC sacked Zidane and appointed Ahmed Mouyeteg as Prime Minister, who resigned months later. Elections soon followed and the Council of Deputies, also known as the House of Representatives, was voted into Parliament. Further fighting broke out between groups loyal to the new parliament and supporters of the GNC. The internationally recognized House of Representatives was driven out of Tripoli and began to govern instead from the far eastern city of Tobruk. But now Libya could be on the verge of a new beginning. The two rival parliaments have signed an historic agreement in Morocco to form a unity government. But with opposition from supporters of both groups, Critics question just how genuine this unity government is. Charlotte Dubinsky, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now to discuss what could be a turning point in Libya's history is Hafid al Ghuel, a Libyan political analyst and senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Thanks for joining us. Is this a great moment? Well, it's not a great moment, to be honest. Uh, it, it, it's, as, as your uh, um, reporter has just put out, there are two parties here to this uh, to this agreement today. However, in Libya, there are a lot of other parties that have not been included in this. And therefore, uh, it, it really is not a, a very comprehensive one. Um, it is It serves the purposes of the international community whose only interest in Libya is really so far is is to find a government that's willing to sign 
uh, uh, all kinds of things with them to, to allow them to fight ISIS and, and st uh, stop the, the illegal immigrants into Europe. However, uh, it, uh, whether it will be able to actually benefit Libya itself is not really very clear. These people are the same people who have been fighting for the last almost five years over the spoils uh, of Muammar Gaddafi. And, and, you know, like th there's no honor among thieves. In a sense, they've been killing each other for a while, uh, tearing the country apart, and now getting them around the table to, to, to uh, share power with each other is not really a, a, a peace agreement. It's more of a power sharing agreement among a very specific groups. Uh, for example, the, the large segments uh, of tribes and, 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 and fighters and former uh, officials of Gaddafi uh, across all ranks are not included in this agreement. Some of them, all estimates say about a million of them live in Egypt. That's 20% of the Libyan population that is in exile. If those people are not included in this agreement, I, I, I hardly think this is something that's going to make a difference in the long term. Well, that's not a very optimistic uh, view. Just before we started chatting to you, we were talking about Tunisia and, you know, we were, we were assessing the past five years and I guess in the big picture we came out of it looking at a lot of, a lot of overwhelming positives with a few negatives and a lot of challenges. Just how different is it with Libya? I mean, Libya seems like and looks like a total pathologically failed state. Is it? It, it is. It really is. And, and, and one of the, you know, the, and, and it is the fault of the Libyans. I'm not here to, to say this is anybody else's fault. However, the international community contributed to that very actively in 2011, not only by uh, 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 bringing down uh, uh, the regime of Muammar Gaddafi in the same manner they've done with Saddam Hussein without learning the consequences of that from Iraq. And they repeated it verbatim in Libya and left it after that. But also, uh, the international community did not want to recognize that that was a civil war, that Libya was not really uh, a, a, a coup of some sort or a regime change as you had in Egypt or Tunisia, but it was essentially a civil war between those who supported Gaddafi and those who were against him. Uh, a lot of them turned out to be sort of uh, elements of a very uh, extremist Islamist groups, mm -hmm. which later on developed into what we see today. By not recognizing that it was a civil war in 2011 and still insisting that not to recognize it as such, what you do is you basically essentially create a, a, a real a chaos in a country. Because if you recognize it was a civil war, then that triggers certain kind of thinking and processes of reconciliation from the beginning in 2011. But by not accepting that, you ended up basically allowing a, a very small segment, an extremist segment, and it turned out that we didn't even know much about them. And, you know, people like Hillary Clinton and others sort of just believed what they told them in 2011. Uh, allowed them to, to take uh, not only power and recognition internationally, but also all the money and arms available in the country. Hafid al -Khwel, thank you very much for joining us. It's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you, sir. After decades of strife, strikes and an industry-wide decline, Britain will close its last remaining deep coal mine this week. The closure will bring an end to the UK's historic relationship with coal mines, an industry which fueled the Industrial Revolution and the rise of the British Empire. In today's Picture This, we take a look at Britain's last farewell to deep coal mining.
Today's newsmaker has been Mohamed Bouazizi, the young vegetable seller who exactly five years ago set himself on fire. It was an event that would trigger the Arab Spring. Unemployment, a lack of political freedom, corruption and poor living conditions were the catalyst for change back in 2011. But five years on, some say pride has been replaced with disillusion. Unemployment stands at more than 15% and many say they are worse off than before the revolution. The growing threat of militancy also threatens to undermine the country's security. Some estimates say the birthplace of the Arab Spring is the largest exporter of ISIS militants in the world. And if allowed to take root in the country, could be the undoing of the Arab Spring's so-called success story. You've been watching this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. Thanks for watching. Bye.